Hey, it's Lisa. Are you feeling burned out? You've got lots of company. That's one of the findings of new research, that burnout, it's one of the big issues among working parents. But there are people who've muscled through, like our panel of moms we featured in a past episode, all of who have achieved the title of vice president while working and parenting. So in light of our research results, we take a look back at their conversation about how they built their families and careers and advice they have for new parents about to embark on the same path. You're listening to The Work-Life Equation, the Bright Horizons podcast for busy working families. Whether you're a working mom, a dad, or you're busy caring for other family members, we've got tips for how to fit jobs and families together and for how to make your work-life equation add up. For me, I followed my passions and the work that I like to do, but in the meantime, started a family and sort of just had to match those two things together and muddle along. This is Helen. She's a VP in human resources and a single mom of two. It certainly wasn't a conscious career choice for me or conscious to sort of do that at the same time as starting a family. But, you know, I think you you deal with the circumstances that you have and, and that's when you start having to make it all work. I always knew that I was going to be a mom, and I always knew that I was going to have a career. And lucky for me, those things did happen. Here's Eileen. She's the VP of Communications, and she's got two children. I started out my career not trying to figure out how to make them happen together. And I worked really hard and a lot of hours doing something that I loved and had a blast doing in my 20s. And... I think my career built because of what I put in there. And at that time, I wasn't thinking of how to make it happen with motherhood. But that said, it did get to a point where I knew that career wasn't sustainable. That particular career wasn't sustainable with a family. I worked in politics. There was virtually no one else who had families. So when I left politics, I knew I didn't have my family right on the horizon, but I did find the value in coming to a place that was going to be family friendly. And this was before I was married um, and certainly before I had kids. Christine is also a single mom. She has one girl and she's a marketing VP. I think uh, similar to both Helen and Eileen, my my journey kind of happened by accident. You know, I became a single mom pretty early on and when my daughter was six months old, I found myself working a little more independently, I guess. And at that point in time, I really didn't think I could have a career and be a single mother. At the time, I lived over an hour away from my job. My goal really was to maintain my job and do a good job, and that's really all I wanted. And what I found was, you know, being a single mom kind of forced me to work differently at work. I really started thinking about the people that were around me and working much more as a team. And I think as a result of me changing my approach to work and my approach to how I functioned within my department, it really changed a lot of what my position looked like. That was almost the start of what felt like a pretty steady trajectory. Well, I think I'm I'm like Eileen. I actually joined a company that was family friendly. And this is Jesse. That for me was a bit of a shift in terms of what I was doing career-wise. She's the VP of brand content and creative, and she has three kids, all adopted from Guatemala. Because I knew that I wanted to start a family. So I was doing my own thing and being a writer and really loving that. But when when my husband and I decided that we were going to build a family and when we realized that it might be not quite as easy as we as we might have hoped, I felt like I needed to have a job with more stability and that working for myself probably wasn't the greatest idea. So I also looked for a company that I thought would be a good place to be at while raising a family. One of the things that really strikes me about all the stories that you just told is you've all accomplished a lot. I mean, you all have have very lofty careers here, but you all sound vaguely surprised. (laughs) Well, the funny thing is also, you know, if you asked me on any given Tuesday, I wouldn't, it's pretty rare that you on a day-to-day basis feel like you've accomplished a lot. I think, you know, I still feel the way I did 15 years ago, which is there's a lot of work to do and I've done some good stuff, but there's still a lot more ahead of me. Well, I love what Christine said, the story around, you know, you sort of focus on what you need to focus on. You know, in your case, it was just like keeping your job and just keeping going. And that actually gives a lot of clarity. It's like, I, I need to understand what my priorities are. And actually people often respond to that around me. It's like, it's obvious what I'm here to do and you know I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing things that don't matter 
And I think that also focuses my mind in terms of our organizational objecti- objectives and how I tie into this. So for me, it hasn't hindered my career to, to need to also focus on my family. But, you know, we are not a representative sample. <clears throat> yes. yeah. So we all are here mm-hmm. partially because we joined a family-friendly company. Um, yeah. We all know that it's okay to have our priorities shift back and forth between work and family at this organization. And I know it's certainly not the norm. You've all said this in one way, shape, or form. That is in itself a major strategy is choosing the employer you work for. I think choosing the employer and working at something that you like to do and doing it and working hard at it because it's something that interests you and not because you're building a career trajectory that is going to lead you to some title or leadership position. I like what I want to do and therefore I'm passionate about it and therefore I want to make a difference within my organization. And that's all that I've thought about in terms of deliberately building a a career. So that kind of goes back to that old saying, do what you love and the money will come. Like, yeah. The success will come too, you know. Certainly seems to work for all of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I know you don't think of yourselves as extraordinary, but the reality is that there are a lot of people out there that do have families and do have jobs and follow the same sort of path but haven't achieved the kind of success that you have. So what kind of strategies can you offer? Organization is huge, right? You have to be organized. Like Helen said, I think doing what needs to be done, not wasting a lot of time on the fluff because I think probably the one thing we'd all agree on is there are not enough hours in the day. But at the same time, even with this feeling of, I need three of me, I think, and I don't know, I'm curious what the others think, that finding the time for yourself is really important. I know that for me, that I'm very, very deliberate about that, and I think people sometimes are surprised, but I think that helps me stay organized in the other realms because it helps me stay sane. Yeah, that's something that Jesse definitely does well and I admire. I don't do it very well. I think my strategy is to be unapologetic. I'm unapologetic about the fact that at work I have a family and I have family obligations and you know, next Wednesday that means that at one o'clock I'm leaving because I have to go to my kids' school conference and they hold the conferences between one and three and that's when it's gonna be. And I'm unapologetic with my kids that sometimes I have to be doing work while they're doing something else and I think for me at least I feel like I have to get comfortable with that my kids have a mom who works and there's value in that even if it doesn't always make them happy but I'm curious about that and I wonder for other people around the table whether you all had mothers who worked because when you say you're unapologetic about being a working mother I think I absolutely feel that way too and for me it was of course I'm going to work my mother worked it would never enter my mind that I was not going to work my mom worked my mom was a single mom and it's funny comparing myself to my mom because I look back and you know my mom was that mom who you know she was dean at a a major university in boston and single mom and she was still like scrubbing the kitchen floors every saturday morning on her hands and knees and i think on days when i think that i have it hard i think about what her experience was like back in you know the 70s and 80s and that was probably 10 times harder one of the things i've learned is that every year it seems to me the years seem to really mark a change in what's needed in terms of me as a mom and so not to get too comfortable or or too excited about one set of structures that works because it's all going to change and so you know just like literally taking it year by year and finding out what's needed right now for me yeah, now we had an interesting conversation with somebody recently about the idea of building your network for family responsibilities. But it kind of sounds like based on that, you should really be building an internal network, professional support network. Yeah, and I, but I do think that they go hand in hand because I tend to be incredibly private and it is not comfortable for me to talk about personal things at the workplace. So for example, for all these years when we were trying to adopt a child, I didn't tell anybody in the workplace. And then I finally told, (laughs) you know, and I have realized as I've gotten older that the more you talk about your personal things at work, the more people can relate to you, can offer support for you, can feel connected to you. And so I've really shifted as I've gotten more senior, as I've gotten both (laughs) age-wise and also in terms of my career. And I talk about almost deliberately things that are going on at home much more than I ever did when I was... Uh, more junior. You know, I think that's really important for us to model too, particularly as women, because I think about Mary Lou, who's our COO, and how comfortably she talks about her challenges as a working mom. I think it creates a really nice model, and I I think about how that, we need to think about that translating from us to our 
team members and, and the people that we lead. That is funny to think about this whole model of authentic leadership and just there's something really <laughs> lovely about aging and just getting more and more comfortable with yourself. You know, when you talk about honesty or transparency or being unapologetic, I, I think they do kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Is that comfort with yourself as a leader and as a person of this work life dichotomy I'm not really because I think you have one life and it's kind of how you choose to spend it and you are who you are at home and at work so we need to rename that absolutely (laughs) we've been having that discussion for a while still haven't come up with a yeah you know I want to go back to something because in terms of helping people balance work and life or whatever you want to call it I mean you two didn't really talk about the unapologetic things what yeah because I, mean, I think those are really important I completely agree with that you know I I am relatively newer to Bright Horizons I've been here for four years and I had a job for 15 years before that and every time I got a new boss or every time I moved roles or every time I get a new staff member that is the conversation I have which is like here's who I am here's my life here's what it means for you I get in at this hour, I leave at this hour, here's the best way to contact me. And so I really believe in kind of having those conversations almost aggressively up front. I remember when I was interviewing for this job, having the conversation three or four times with the person who's going to be my boss, saying, are you sure you really understand what this is gonna mean for you? And finally he was like, will you stop trying to talk yourself out of this job? He's like, I get it, I get it. But I think having those conversations proactively and directly helps me feel less conflicted when I need to take advantage of of the flexibility that I that I hope to earn. And I, I, I don't know if it's good or bad, but I've always been willing to accept that my approach to work might not work for everyone. Mm-hmm. Every time I get a new boss, they might need something that's different than what I can bring. And I've always been willing to accept that that conversation may happen someday and that there's something else for me if, if that ever happens. But I love what you just said a minute ago, which was by saying, this is me, that removes all the guilt because you, you've laid it out. This yeah. is me. <laughs> yeah, I think yes. everyone should do that. <laughs> so Helen, what are you unapologetic about? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize a lot. I mean, it's interesting because I'm thinking about what Christine just said about the schedule. I mean, one of the things I'm sensitive to is is my team members, other team members who maybe don't have a family but have other lives, like everybody does, have other big lives. And I work in HR as well, so we want to make sure that we have equity in some regards in terms of how we treat people. And so I'm not sure the answer to this yet, but I I never want someone to think that I'm getting special flexibility because I'm at a more senior level. And it's actually sometimes true. At a more senior level, you do have more flexibility, whatever. You have more control over your your work schedule too, I think. Right. But it's it's a constant dance. How to to make sure that I'm also supporting them in the way they need. So it's not just talking, having a conversation with my manager, but also having a conversation with my team that says, I'm available. You can reach me these ways. So I I mean, I think a lot of what we're saying also is that it's kind of messy and that, you know, we, we have to be very deliberate about it and keep thinking about what do I need, what's important to me, what are my priorities right now, and, you know, and be transparent not only with our, our bosses but also with the people who work for us. Well, I think one of the things as women, I shouldn't speak generally, but I kind of feel like this is true, that we tend to focus on the things that we're not doing versus the things that we are doing well, like the compromises that we make, the things that we feel like we should be doing that we're not. And I think that's a big issue for people, unless you don't feel that way. Are, are there areas where you felt you've had to compromise, and, and how do you deal with that if you have? I think life is a constant compromise, <laughs> and quite frankly, I think that that's true, whether you're a stay-at-home parent, or you're working and you don't have kids, or your life is something else. I think the notion of, can you have it all, what in the world is all? Everybody's making choices all the time, and do I do this thing for my kids and skip this conference at work that I would have had to travel for? Do I fit in this dress and not eat that piece of cake? I mean, you know, it, it, it is everything. But you said something so interesting to me, probably years ago, that I still remember. Remember that men have to make the same choices. They're just socialized to deal with them better. Well, they're socialized to choose work too. Well, how do we help women? You know, you, you guys have made some great inroads. How do we help other women be socialized to feel okay with those choices? That's and a tough question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot we can do to support each other for sure. I mean, again, we've talked about the network and sort of you know constantly reinforcing. It's hard not to get competitive with other moms or with other colleagues who seem to be doing it better. And so, you know, I I certainly try to make a conscious effort to sort of build up my colleagues, support them and, you know, drop anything to support a mom in need, for sure. But I think that when I think about strategies as well, for me, it's also, so I choose to pay someone to clean my house, but I don't choose to pay someone to cut my 
to cut my lawn because I actually enjoy doing that. So I, again, I make really intentional decisions around what are the things I don't love doing and I make, you know, make those choices. Yeah, it's funny. Early on, I mean, I think I talked earlier about focusing on building a team at work and it took me a lot longer to figure out how to build my team at home <laughs> because I found that I was spending every weekend just swimming in life maintenance, which, you know, especially if you're a single mom, like all the housework falls to you, all the repair work falls to you. And so it took me a long time to figure out what was I willing to outsource, even if it meant, you know, paying more money than I wanted to just to have that time that Jesse's talking about. And mm-hmm. And that time is super valuable and it is, you know, my personal time is worth something. So, you know, yeah. and I've gone through periods in, of time where if work is really crazy, I will, I will double up on my home team. You know, I've paid the babysitter to help me pack when I needed to move. I've paid someone to, to go get my dog license for me. Just little things like, like a neighborhood kid to run down to the town hall to do stuff like that, that I just can't get to. Somebody gave me this advice years ago and we've done it and it, and I know that not every scenario lends itself to this, especially, you know, we have two single moms in the group, and so it's not quite so easy, but this has made such a world of difference, and it seems like a small thing, which is every week I have one night, Thursday night, which is my night, and in my case, my husband is able to be on point at home, and Tuesday night is his night, and perhaps if you're a single mom, there's somebody else who can step up on that night. But knowing that I have my Thursday nights when I was talking earlier about having time for myself makes such a world of difference, whether that's being able to do an exercise class or being able to catch up with a friend, which I normally, because in my life, and we didn't mention it before, but I have a a daughter with very, very severe medical needs. So there's no free time if I don't deliberately make it. When I'm home, I literally am in the same room as my daughter all the time. I can't go to the bathroom without her with me. So I have to be deliberate about scheduling that time. But this couple who gave us this idea was two two working parents. They had one child and they were still finding it really difficult to have time for themselves. And so they gave each other the gift of one night a week. And it's been about three years now. And I recommend this to anybody if you're able to do it, to have a night, one night a week that you know is yours. And there is nothing. I mean, it's like a sacrosanct night for both me and for my husband, and it really makes a big difference. When I was a stay-at-home mom, I actually had somebody I would freelance one day a week, and I had childcare that one day a week when my kids were really little. The point was, I was a better mom six days a week than I was seven. One thing that's always been a priority for me, because I like to cook, and maybe that's kind of part of my downtime, is making dinner every night. So I'm a big believer in like homemade dinner every night. We have dinner, we clean up, and then my daughter starts to do her homework, and I open my computer back up, and. We sit at the same table and we're kind of each doing our own version of homework, but in a way we're doing it together. A couple weeks ago, she came in to work with me for a couple hours and on the way home, she said, I'm so impressed by you, mom. And I, you know, I had this, it was, I wasn't doing anything, you know, it wasn't like I was giving a big speech or anything. And I said, oh yeah, why? And she said, I can tell you're really good at your job. And I was like, how can you tell that? And she's like, I don't know. I can just tell by how into it you are. But I think just modeling that it made me feel really good about the choices that I've made even though you know any given choice I might feel torn about I think the sum of the choices is feels to me like it's setting a good example for her it's so funny to think about our kids view of our work because we were watching Moana the other night (laughs) and there's a scene where Moana is slashing the little coconut creatures and slashing them all out of her way and my little 11 year old said to me that's like you at work mom (laughs) I said, what in the world are you talking about? I said, the coconuts are your work, and you're just slashing them out of the way. (laughs) There you have it. In a strange way, that sounds like what what you just said is is sort of another unapologetic moment. We were talking about work and being unapologetic about how your family fits in, but you're saying... The reverse holds true, it also sounds like. Well, I also ask my kids if they want to, quote unquote, help with my work, because I think, you know, we're all talking about flexibility at the workplace, but I think part of the reason or part of the way we take advantage of that flexibility is by knowing that we're going to be logging on later on at night. I mean, for me, I would much rather leave work at a decent hour to have that time with my kids, but I'm absolutely going to be, you know, plugged in virtually every night after they go to sleep. But even if it's, you know, when they're still awake and I have some work to do them, I'll ask if they want to help and show them, you know, so they can see the photographs or the videos or whatever it is and just involve them in it so that growing up with a working mother for them is is not a negative. It's something that we all do. You know, we're all 
participating in the work to a certain extent. I think the teaching them as well, the fact that we all love our jobs, right, it seems to come across. Mm-hmm. I, I think that that's a wonderful message for our children too, that they can find work that they really love. Yeah. Yeah. And these messages we're sending them are, are going to last for a lifetime, that you, need, that you should find a job that you love. And if you find a job that you love, it makes it easier to do it. And as my, my daughters are getting older, I think they see that. And I'm happy that they see that I enjoy my job. I think it's really nice to that for for most of us we had we had our kids in a bright horizon center when they were little and you know for my kids first five years of their lives I was bringing them with me to work and they know what my work is because yeah. they were part of it too and they associate that and they have an affection for bright horizons the idea that you know bringing your kids with you every day they they know that you work and yeah. they know your workplace and they have an identity with it was always nice for me and still is and the other thing you said is unapologetically loving your work yeah. like that's something that I think we're not socialized to believe that you're supposed to love your career that's supposed to be a really important part of you but clearly is a really important part you. It's worked well for you. Eileen was just talking about, you know, her early child care support team. And one of the other things that I think made my career progression when my daughter was very young possible was that I had a really good and reliable team that cared for my daughter. You know, I didn't have to worry at all. Like I dropped her off early. If I was running late, they understood. It just, it was not an issue. And it really freed me up to when I was at work, I was thinking about work and I wasn't, I didn't have like six other things going on in the back of my head. I often credit that team with helping me. I noticed that most when, when my child's when my daughter started school and I realized that the after school program, as good as it was, wasn't <laughs> yeah. as attuned to working parents. And yeah. there were all these things like the way that we filled in all of our forms every year that were like really just seemed to assume that I had way more time than I actually <laughs> did. And so I think, you know, finding your support system that is really attuned to working parents is also a strategy that again is somewhat unconscious I think but then you, you come up against it when you find people who don't understand that you can't make cupcakes or you know whatever it is yeah. a cupcake yeah. thing it was yeah. a big thing for me I don't have a single relative who is either local enough or able enough to be part of my support me neither. network me yeah. neither. so having that system it was the child care center when my kids were young and insanely fortunate I think with our after school programs from both of my kids schools that are actually at the school so there's no transportation issue but I think you have to have a system in some ways I actually think having a non familial <laughs> support network um, can have its upsides because it does not come with the um, <laughs> emotional uh, <laughs> obligations and favor trading that sometimes a, a family situation Easier to be can. apologetic yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> no guilt but I do think that it's important for people to know that it can work when family is not part of that situation because I know for so many people that's really a struggle so I don't have that and I think that if you can't make it work so again in our situation which is you know pretty unusual that's where the stress comes in because you and so I see both sides I see how great it is for example when I had my three kids in Bright Horizon centers to have that reliability and to know that nobody's calling out sick I mean mm-hmm. somebody calls out sick it's not going to impact you they, they will find a caregiver to step in and now I see the other side because if I have a caregiver call out then I can't come into work and I see how tough that is and that you know I'm sure for a lot of people who are listening to this that is their reality yeah but the other thing I wanted to say is, you know, I think we make it sound like, oh, you know, I figured it out and I'm making it it's really easy. And, but I do think that there are things for sure that you have to give up. There is absolutely no way yeah. that you can be everything you want to be in the workplace and everything you might ascribe to be in the personal life. And my example of this is when my first child was in public school and I they were talking about a room mother and I thought, that's really cool. I'm going to be the room mother. And I called my best friend who's a stay-at-home mom who has been the room mother at her kid's school. And I said, what do you think? I, I think I'm going to sign up to be the room mother. And she said, absolutely not. There is no way you can be the room mother. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'd be such a good room mother. And she was like, no, you cannot be the room mother. Just trust me. And so I've never been a room mother. Now, maybe I would hate it, but apparently you need to have a lot of extra time. And, and I was a room mother. You were really Yeah, we, we yeah. both were the first, for the first year we both moved to the same school district. And then we just, I didn't, haven't done it since. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, you weren't very good for a mother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't mean yeah. 
not right. <laughs> I also think it's that something that Eileen said earlier about this idea of having it all, it, like to me, feels like a very <laughs> outdated notion. You know, like when we were growing up, there was a food pyramid, and the idea was, you know, at every meal you had to have a, a green <laughs> and a meat and a vegetable. and. And now the, the latest thinking is as long as you get most of what you need in a period of time, that's what's healthy. And I kind of think the same thing about having it all yeah. is you can have pieces of it. <laughs> you know, you can have pieces of anything, but it's pretty rare that on any given day you feel like you have excelled at work and you have excelled at life. And I think sometimes we have to be happy with I had a great day at work and I'm doing the best I can at home or vice versa. I think that's a really great point and I think sometimes that's better on both fronts when you're able to fully, today's going to be just work or today's going to be just family because the days where you're going back and forth where you might have a parent-teacher conference before work starts and then you have to go to work and then you have to make a personal call in the middle of the day and then you have to go you know, help your older parent or whatever it is, I feel like I'm changing costumes all day long and it's exhausting. Mm. I'd rather say today... You know, I'm just primarily focused on this one thing because it's very exhausting to be switching so much over the course of each day. It's like super mom and super employee. It's really yeah. Fun. yeah. I mean, yeah. I have days where I come home and I say I'm off duty for the next half hour. So <laughs> Mommy needs to tag. If there's it. anything that yeah. you need that has anything to do with me being a parent, you're gonna have to figure it out. <laughs> And, and I just take that time. I think the fact that I work brings a lot to how I parent in a way that I hope at least are good for my kids. What is one thing you guys give up, have to give up that you wish you didn't have to? Like if someone gave you five more hours a week? I have moved from a town that I love to a place that is closer to work, you know? So I think I gave up, you know, a lifestyle. I think if I had five hours I might like to spend more time with friends I think that there's very little time for me to do that mm -hmm. I'd like to say that I would use it as me time and go to the gym and spend time with friends in all reality I just think I'd spend five more hours doing what I do I mean I've got to be honest about it it just is what it is but yeah I would like it for myself we yeah, sleep would be more mm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so sleep sleep would be a good one <laughs> mm. It would be exercise, um, whether I would actually do it or not. <laughs> I don't know. But I also like sleep, so. <laughs> sleep is good. Yeah, I wish I could be one of those people who gets up at five and exercises and, and is happy about mm. it. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely not a morning person. And, you know, now I use time as an excuse probably not to exercise, so I guess I'd like to have that time to challenge myself to say, is that really the excuse or not? So I'm sure there are more times when each one of us thought, I can't do this anymore, this is so crazy, I'm out of control, but I don't remember them being... No, oh, I goodness. never, ever, ever once thought that I would be a stay-at-home mom. No. No, me neither. I mean, you know, I'm going through a kitchen renovation right now, and I have to say, you know, you don't realize what a house of cards it is until one piece wobbles. <laughs> There's definitely, I think, more stress than we realize with this all that we're talking about but again I know it's a theme but I love what I do I mean I remember when my second child when, when her maternity leave was finished with the second one I remember being so happy to go back and put her in the hands of the professionals and you know and, and do work that I could control um, so I love love being a parent and love being an employee so yeah yeah I, I've never thought about quitting to be a stay-at-home mom I have spent Probably an unhealthy amount of time thinking about winning the lottery. <laughs> yes. And then being able to quit and how I would spend <laughs> all of my time and money. But uh, but no, I haven't thought about giving up the job to be a stay at home. Yeah, I, I agree. There's nothing I'm really missing. If you want to hear more from our VP moms and about our research, take a look at our webinar recording, Parenting into the New Decade. You can find it on our website at brighthorizons.com. If you like what you heard today, get more of our podcast by subscribing. While you're downloading, let us know what you thought or give us a share. Thanks to everyone for being here. We look forward to seeing you next time as we help make the work-life equation add up.